Hi everyone. In these videos from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the mechanics of breathing. Specifically in this video, we're going to take a look at the pressures that exist within the thoracic cavity. The next video, we'll look at the actual mechanism by which we take a breath and discuss the implications that it has not just on the respiratory physiology, but importantly for anesthesiologists on the cardiovascular system as well. Following videos, we'll discuss what happens to the respiratory physiology when we place a patient on a ventilator and how it changes. So, as you can see, I've drawn here in the interest of time my lung and thorax. On the left side, uh, stage left, I've overlaid the lung tissue with intercostal muscles in red and ribs in dark gray. And on the stage right side, or left side looking at the screen, we have our visceral pleura in green, our parietal pleura in blue, and our thoracic wall in orange. In the middle in red, we have our heart, and on the bottom, we have the diaphragm. Now, the first thing we need to do is identify the three different pressures that act on normal lung physiology and understand why and how they do so. But before any of that, we have to go back to our favorite equation, pressure equals force over area. And that pressures are going to change as we change our area. And it's gonna be this equation that dictates the reason for changes in pressure and ultimately the movement of air when we do breathe. Again, as area increases, our pressure is going to drop and vice versa. So we have a couple pressures here. We have our intra-alveolar pressure, which is gonna be inside this space, inside our alveoli here. And that's going to be normal at about 760 millimeters of mercury. And this should sound familiar because it's the same pressure as outside the thorax or atmospheric pressure, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So when the epiglottis opens, allowing us to either inspire or phonate, since there's no longer a separation between the atmosphere and the airway, it's one continuous space, the pressure is equalized between the two. It's the same reason that the right atrium and the superior vena cava, or the central venous pressure there, have the same pressures because there's no separation between the two. This acts the same way. Now, there's also one more pressure at play here, and that's the intra pleural pressure. And that's this space right here. The intrapleural pressure, the intrapleural pressure is about four less than the intraalveolar pressure at 756 millimeters of mercury. So looking at our anatomy, we have to recognize that the pleura, there's two different types of pleura. There's the, well, there's a couple different kinds. There's the parietal pleura, which binds to the, which is attached to the thoracic wall. Our visceral pleura, which is attached to the actual lung tissue itself. Then we have the portion of the th uh, parietal pleura that attaches to the surface of the diaphragm and part that attaches to the mediastinum. Now, the visceral and parietal pleura, they're actually all part of the same tissue. It just kind of folds back on itself. But they are basically, if we're going to draw in free space here, very, very, very close proximity to one another, being separated only by this very thin layer of pleural fluid. And that's what's responsible for allowing the two layers to slide against one another without causing friction and damaging the tissue. Now, it's not technically a space because, you know, the fluid is there, but it's a potential space. And it's referred to sometimes as negative pressure. And the reason is that it's actually negative relative to the intraalveolar pressure. It's minus four when compared to the 760. And it's very important that it remains negative, as we'll see in pathologies like pneumothoraces and stuff, because when we have this alveoli, and we have the visceral pleura here, and we have the parietal pleura here, there's a pressure being exerted onto the lung parenchyma by the visceral pleura, but, I apologize, by the parietal pleura, it's important that it's less than the pressure exerted by the lung tissue here in order to keep it expanded. 760 is greater than 
756, which allows the lung to remain expanded. Now, in pathologies like pneumothoraces, when air gets into that space and this pressure goes up, that's what leads to our lung collapse. But we're going to get to that a little bit later. So we also need to understand what makes this space under less pressure. So I'm going to redraw my two layers here and also put our chest wall out over here, which is attached. So there are three reasons that this space in between the two here remains negative, and we're going to discuss them now. As we said, pressure equals force over area. So if we can increase the area between the visceral and parietal pleura, you'll drop the pressure. And that's basically what our body does. First, the elasticity of the lung or its tendency to recoil, because the lung tissue is directly attached to the visceral pleura, as the lung recoils, it will pull the visceral pleura away ever so slightly from the parietal pleura, increasing that space and working to decrease the pressure. Now the next part I'm also going to draw in here, and this is going to be the surface tension of alveoli and their propensity to collapse. And it's the surface tension and, well, the surfactant that keeps them open against the surface tension, but it goes in and is paired with elasticity in trying to pull the lung tissue back in. So we have elasticity, we have surface tension, both of which are trying to pull the lung back to its smallest possible form, pulling it away from the visceral pleura, I apologize, from the parietal pleura, and then finally, we have the pressure exerted outward by the chest wall. Now, the chest wall is elastic, just like the lung, but rather than pulling in, it's pulling outward, thus pulling the parietal pleura further away from the visceral pleura. So to summarize, we have these three different pressures that interact with lung physiology at baseline, and it's crucial to understand these aspects of physiology to understand not just the pathology of pneumothoraces or CHF exacerbations or negative pressure pulmonary edema, but how we're going to deal with it. And again, those three pressures are the chest wall recoil, or its propensity to kind of pull the parietal pleura off the visceral pleura, and then the elasticity and the surface tension of the lung itself, which is attached to the visceral pleura, that will pull the lung in. And it's these forces all acting that helps to kind of almost ever so slightly increase our intrapleural space or area, which then goes and leads to a decrease in intrapleural pressure. So that's all for the basics of the pressures of the respiratory system. In the next video, we'll take a look at the actual mechanism by which we take a breath, why air flows in the direction it does, how the pressures change, and what implications this, this has on the cardiovascular system, all of which is vital to understand for when we discuss the in implications of placing a patient on a ventilator. As always, if you have any questions or concerns or interested in getting involved, please feel free to write to us. Check us out on Instagram and subscribe below.